it is very important to train those who are going to teach watercolor in all terms. We have a very special guest, Vladimir Merchensky from Argentina, a great artist, a great teacher, but also a researcher. The work of research is very important for all of us to establish, to measure the activity of watercolor, not only from the point of view of artistic production, but of its behavior in the start market, of its dissemination and education. Vladimir Merchansky, thank you for being with us. IWS thanks you for sharing with us your experiences, your research, and for making us wiser in this matter. Thank you very much, Tere. What a great introduction. It's sincerely an honor to be here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to Tere Lojero and the entire organization of the International Watercolor Society, of course. In Tanta Tinta School, we are very happy about this event. I am very happy to participate and to be able to talk with you about this subject that has occupied me for so long. The first thing I would like to clarify is that this talk is based on a project that will occupy my whole life and that I hope will occupy the life of many more people. The International Watercolor Teacher Training Program. I'm going to illustrate with images some of the ideas that give birth and origin to this program. I'm going to illustrate a scenario of what is happening in watercolor in the last few years and talk about what could happen with the execution of this program, which is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting projects that could have the community of watercolorists around the world. I'm going to share a screen to talk about this subject. I want to start this conversation with this example. How works the International Languages Language Congresses? In this image, we see Fontana Rosa, a very important Argentine writer, admired by all. And we see many writers gathered together, talking and allowing themselves to ask about the use of language, especially because they are capable of producing an aesthetic from the use of language. They are not the only ones. The people, when they make a joke, when they give a nickname to a person, are making an aesthetic use of language. All the time we are reinventing language, mixing it with other languages, using expressions in new ways, almost without releasing it. We are inaugurating new uses all the time and happen the same thing with plastic languages in visual arts. So I choose to illustrate the beginning of this talk with this image because I want to make it clear that what we are proposing in the program is clay or putty for modeling. I mean, it's something that is totally virgin, something to be done and that we can do it together. I'm confident that we are going to do it together that's going to improve the life of our community without exaggeration for the whole of the people. First, we will talk about positive things in the present scenario. In this image, I'm showing four issues that for me are fundamental in what is happening with watercolor today. Watercolor has been very visible in the networks for quite some time now. We know, for example, that thanks to the way the transparency of its colors looks on the screen. Social networks are showing watercolors everywhere and people are falling in love with them. And this obviously means that there are more sales of watercolor materials in art shops. There are more courses to learn it. There are more festivals. There are more organizations. There are more prizes. There are incentives. Well, this is the world of what occurred today. Ten years ago, this didn't happen, or at least it didn't happen with this acidity. We have, however, a scenario to improve. As this image illustrates, there is a huge gap between what is professional watercolor, a work by the great César on the right, to give just one example among many, and watercolor, an amateur watercolor. 
I mean, that a person who starts to paint watercolors encounters a lot of technical problems and wonders how a professional can achieve this artwork quality on the right side. That is one of the issues or problems, the gap between the professional and the amateur. The second issue is that many people imagine the watercolors is a subject for children and that is a technique that is only useful on an initial or primary education as an element as if it doesn't exist on other areas. Then we have the problem of the art academies, teachers, schools, and above all, the content programming of the official education systems underestimate the technique. They favor the education of other languages, such as sculpture, engraving, and oil on ac or acrylic painting. Well, this is also an issue. Then there is another issue that curtails the activity of watercolor, the art market. At fairs, galleries, and art spaces, the attitude of collectors also greatly underestimates watercolors worldwide. Because it is on paper instead of canvas and other reasons. Besides, watercolor painting in general has lost followers since the invention of concept art. So, there we also have another lost ground that we have to see how to how we can recover. On the other hand, in the art world, watercolor has a reputation for being a difficult technique. In the past, it was considered a complex technique and England have taken care to reinforce this idea. The English, who love watercolors and who were one of the first countries in Europe to have a society. I am referring to a royal watercolor society. From that moment on, they set out to promote watercolor as a technique for experts. This also hindered the development of watercolor in the Western culture. But there is something else. When you go to an art store to buy a watercolor product, the shop assistant usually doesn't know much about this technique. This is also detrimental or a negative scenario for the growth of watercolor. A watercolor has one more little problem. What is sold is often very poor quality product. In general, this is due to distribution limitations and consumption limitations. What we can buy in an art store in a town or a non very populous city for example, in Latin America, is low quality or school quality. So, all those subjects are complicating the development of the activity around watercolor. This illustration, which is not watercolor, helps me to talk about another important issue, which is the tendency of some teachers to teach thematic courses. This is also somewhat detrimental to the development of a technique in total freedom. A technique that gives an artist autonomy so he can express himself. This habit we have of publishing manuals and books that explains how to paint flowers, how to paint seeds, how to paint trees, as if each subject requires a totally different use of technique and language. This is also very detrimental to the artistic activity or expression of the artist. Later, I will talk about what it means to be an artist for me. I mean, the point of view I have of this concept, of course. There is another issue that interests me a lot. Teachers are not being able to bring together or unite knowledge. They are very dispersed, despite the fact that there are a lot of festivals and events where we get together. The truth is that each teacher is still working on his or her little book of knowledge, and there is very little places to share and distribute this knowledge in a more democratic way. Another issue that worries me a lot, I think we use anachronistic terminology. For example, we say that one possible use of watercolor is wet on wet, and so on. Well, we have different terminologies, but there are a lot of expressions that are left out. For example, this kind of drainage in the work of Nico Lopez from Peru has no place within that terminology. So they are re relegated to effects when in fact those are expressions proper to the language of watercolor. They are set aside the drips, the drains, 
the spills and many other expressions. They are relegated to the side because the language we use to teach them is limited and it's anachronistic, of, out of date. The other issue that also strikes me a lot, which is difficult to change, is tradition and mandates in technique. For example, don't use black or don't use white gouache. It still strikes me that competitions and organizations discriminate against the imprinting of new expressions. This is a work by William Turner, where he used gouache. It's an example that historically watercolor was not as restricted and dogmatic as it is shown in some contests. Criteria that follows a tradition that is too conservative. This contemporary custom of re rejecting a work that is not pure watercolor according to traditional or English usage. If it has gouache or ink, if it has collage or some kind of mixed media, it is cast off. This is very striking to me, that this discrimination continues to happen while art has expanded to such extraordinary places in terms of its expressions. Another issue for this negative scenario, or that harms the development of watercolor, is the official pedagogical system. The huge crisis that the educational system has suffered and that harms art in general. This system that supports the obsolete objective of standardization, where we are all equal, as the education system demanded in the industrial revolution. We still think that we need schools that educate us all with the same levels of knowledge. In the meantime, the labor market has changed a lot, especially since the invention of new technologies, and now with the existence of COVID, of course. So we need new pedagogies. We need to carry out a deep review of what we call school and the education system. In this revision, we should have room for artistic languages and above all for watercolor, which within these languages offers very broad expressive possibilities. I am convinced that watercolor can revolutionize the world in terms of the possibilities it can give us a didactic level in schools. But there is also another issue that justifies it. The behavior of the markets where social networks and other tools need producers of visual contents. So there is also an argument there. We increasingly need more and more videos, more photos, more paintings and more visual languages to generate consumption and help the economy to function. There is a market for the production of these images that we would be generating generating from the dissemination of watercolor, especially because of the creativity and the importance with which we can approach any kind of subject matter. Ergo, after telling you all this, what I am trying to say is that the implementation of a teacher training program is a very important issue. We are talking about training watercolor teachers by bringing together the efforts of the community of watercolorists from all over the world and empowering those new teachers through certificates. Giving strength to this project would allow the watercolor community to resolve many issues related to the scenarios I just mentioned. Now I'm going to talk a little about the advantages of this new scenario with trained teachers. On the one hand, watercolor itself is an inclusive activity, not only because it's an activity for all ages, but also for communities. It's a therapeutic activity of sensitivity. We could even use it as a medical tool for people with reduced mobility or neurological diseases. It's a tool with a lot of power. Why does it have that power? Because when you paint with watercolor, you have to be present. You are here and now, because there is water, because you have to be in dialogue with the painting and with this water. In acrylic and oil painting, the artist strokes and the stroke stays where the person put it. In watercolor, on the other hand, there is a dialogue with the water. You have to listen and feel what is happening. You have to perceive what is happening to the brush and the paper. You have to understand transparency. You have to understand 
three different waters, the water on the palette, on the paper, and on the brush. So it generates a totally different release of control and attention. After 15 years of teaching classes on the use of this material, I can assure you that working in class with watercolor is not simply producing a communicative piece. It is therapeutic work. It is a work, I would almost say, of a psychology session. I dare say that it has a lot to do with psychology. Now, we talk about watercolor and we must be aware that it has an amazing expressive range. Within the technique of visual language, in any plastic discipline, it is one of those with the greatest expressive range. Here I am showing some examples with drainage. I should have had other examples, such as random stains from strokes with different amount of water on the paper. And we would realize that the expressive range is really extraordinary. It's an exponential thing. It's infinite. It has many infinities. That really catches my attention to the point that I still fall in love with watercolor every day. And I've dedicated myself to it since I was six, seven years old. Here I'm going to move on the very quick examples of work. For example, this is by Angelo Gorlini. This is a work by Chen Tung Wei with sketch and source photography. And this is a work by Sunga Park. I choose them very randomly among works by many, many masters whom I adore to show that expressive range. This variation of the stain, this dialogue with the water, this delicacy on, and refinement, I showed very little. I could show 700 more images, but we don't have time. The important thing is, if we generate a teacher training project, we give a job opportunity to a lot of artists, provided, of course, that they have a teaching vocation. But the artist can perfectly well teach what he or she practices. Moreover, by teaching, he improves as an artist. When, as an artist, someone shares a personal method with others, I assure you that his art improves. So, being a teacher improves me as an artist. And being an artist improves me as a teacher. It's a feedback, just as a, as a relationship with a student is a feedback. Something very interesting is sharing. I feel that the artist is a rather withdrawn bug. We have this image from Romanticism. We have the image of the artist as an isolated being who closes himself in, this, in his shell or cave and produces from there, whereas the teacher has this capacity to share, which is, of course, much more productivist if you like. It is much more advantageous for an activity to grow. So, if we have more watercolor teachers, we will have a much greater possibility of exchanging knowledge than if we keep this community limited only to artistic activity. Of course, watercolor teaching already exists today. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist in the way we are talking about. We are talking about a systematic way for there to be more universities for watercolorists and for there to be universities where watercolor teachers are trained which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. We are talking about a project to create a job that apparently doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Only three places in the world offer watercolor classes to train watercolorists. Thailand, China, and a city in Peru called Arequipa. In the other countries, watercolor is one discipline among many others, and most of the time very underestimated in art academies. But there is no art academy outside these three countries that teaches watercolor as a specialty, and where somebody can graduate as a watercolorist with a degree. Now, I'm interested in raising a new question. What is the reason that makes us propose watercolor as a popular activity. What makes an activity popular? 
In this image, we compare polo, an elite sport, with soccer, a very popular sport in Argentina, for example. Soccer is played everywhere, in a square or a small street in a, in a neighborhood. With a ball, two posts, sometimes there aren't goal posts and some clothes replace it. And with these elements, it's enough to play soccer. What does it mean? To practice this sport, you don't need to have money. It's not necessary. Soccer is not an elite sport. Polo is. First, because you have to get a place to breed a horse. But there is more. It is almost an attitudinal issue. In other words, it's not a popular sport. Why does a sport become popular or why does an activity become popular? We could say, well, we have to lower the cost of materials. This is debatable. For example, if we think that for something to be popular or consumed, we have to lower it, its costs, mobile telephony would never have existed. Mobile telephony was revolutionized. It became cheaper and consumption demand increased. If we generate an increase in consumption of a product, the industry lowers costs. What we have to do is to generate more consumption. When we have more teachers, there will be more people practicing watercolor. Then it will be cheaper not only to produce, but also to transport and distribute the material. It will also be more economical to train the right salespeople to, so the material reaches the consumer properly. So it's not a question of thinking that watercolor cannot be popular because it is expensive to breed the horse, because it is expensive to buy a Daniel Smith or Holbein tube. This is the wrong way of thinking. And while that is happening, which will take time, we can work with natural pigments, for example. We will buy nogalin mixed with Arabic gum and we will learn how to teach with nogalin. Or if we have problems with paper, which is an expensive paper, we will use a medium quality paper and learn how to stiffen it because in the end, the problem with the paper is not its weight or fiber composition, 100 cotton or not. The problem with the paper is the surface gelatin the correct parchment sizing for a slow seeping of wet paint into the fibers. We know that if we have worked a little in teaching watercolor. Another important issue, a friend of mine who now lives in Germany, Gerardo, proved that we can produce watercolor canvas. His brand is Bunt. It will be available soon, finally. We need to be able to produce it in order to lower the cost of material with which to execute our disciplines. This is something we can do perfectly well if we agree as a collective. In other words, if the community of watercolorists decides that they want to produce watercolor canvas because paper is too expensive, or for ecology, we can do it perfectly well. Then we have to work in communion to make that happen. And another thing we have to do is to work in communion with the brands, the companies. We have to work in communion with the brands because they have common objectives with us. A training program for watercolor teachers has common objectives with the commercial objectives of the companies that produce the watercolor materials. So, we have here a quick start to activate a lot of joint activities. Another very important issue, we educators have to specialize not only in technical issues, but also in pedagogy. For example, we have to know the Suzuki method, which studies the way we learn our mother tongue in order to apply it to the acquisition of other knowledge. We have to study the Montessori method and the Baldorf method. We have to read Victor Lowenfeld, Herbert Red, or the ignorant schoolmaster by Jacques Rancière. For example, there is Donald Winnicott, who works with doodling. Well, there are a lot of possibilities on a didactic level that we have to investigate in order to get out of the traditional pedagogy of the art academies, which have systematically left us out. The COVID pandemic, which has changed our social behavior in such a sudden and abrupt way, as far as art education is concerned, at least in the school I direct, it was a positive blow 
because it allowed us to understand a teaching method that has new limits and new shapes and that student and, and that suddenly opens our education system to a global market at least in the spanish speaking world a huge market initially I had a big prejudice against giving online classes through Zoom or similar platforms. And in the execution of this program, I have realized that there are many enormous advantages. We have students from different countries around the world. We are advancing by leaps and bounds in the acquisition of the technique. So, it's a new scenario that can bring a lot to this program. A lot. We cannot ignore this new scenario, this new situation. On the one hand, the information available on the internet horizontalizes educational processes. Fortunately, we have abandoned certain habits. In the past, we had this vertical structure in which the teacher was an authority. Nowadays, we can all acquire knowledge from the great sources of the internet. Of course, mixed with a lot of rubbish, but then it will be up to us to discern and discriminate, and above all, to discriminate by taste, which is a very valuable thing, at least as far as art is concerned. That is to say that this horizontality is a fact, a reality that benefits in many ways an educational process. Another important issue, watercolor as an expressive possibility needs a pedagogy where to develop the freshness of execution and where to develop the linking. I show this image as an example because I find it amazing how children have no prejudice about the medium or the technique to use. They can paint their brother or their pet because they have no should be. They don't have a mandate that tells them this is the right way. Well, that freedom is what we need to add in our pedagogical system because it's going to give us a lot of benefits at a behavioral level. Let's say it's going to give us health benefits. It will benefit our way of being in the world. That's why I say that watercolor is not only a technique, but a therapy and a way of living better. This clock was a didactic tool developed and published by Joseph Zbubik in one of his books to give a more appropriate reference to expressions like wet on wet and other anachronistic terms. He then posits that the consistency of watercolor can be red as a tea, coffee, milk, cream, butter, and on this side of the clock, the paper can be dry, damp, moist, or wet. I find this way very didactic, of course. In fact, on the school, we made this matrix where we show that the water on the palette defines this intensity, light or dark, and the water on the paper defines if there is a focus, out of focus, bloom edges or fading edges. It seems to me that we need these kind of tools to improve our way of communicating the use and acquisition of technique. In other words, what we need is to develop together a heuristic for acquiring this knowledge, to be able to say, let's see, how do we explain this in a simpler way? How do we explain this in a more accessible way? It seems to me that this can be done collectively. It can be thought collectively. And stop giving watercolor classes in canned recipes, like a course on how to paint flowers. Start thinking in graphemes, in basic cells of use, like any other language. For example, say, this is a full plane, this is a rustic gesture, this is a hybrid stain, this is a diffuse gesture, this is a background. This is a precise diffuse gesture. This is a drainage or a lateral contamination. Start giving precise and scientific names. For example, why is this a diffuse gesture? Because it is a physical chemical phenomenon called diffusion. This is to say, we need to be 
willing to work with maps, being aware that this map is restrictive. This is not painting with watercolor. This is explaining the technique. Afterwards, painting will be an infinite universe, not a recipe. The map is not the territory. We already know that. But we need a precise map that includes the current language and works in a statutory way. That is to say, a map that fragments this knowledge into small pieces, where the pupil gets enormous satisfaction from the first steps. We need a program in which the student obtains maximum satisfaction in a very short period of time in order to feel motivated to acquire more information about the technique. That is very important. In other words, we need to work a lot on our didactic and pedagogy in order to think about these pyramids with each of the cells and with each of the exercises. This is precisely a heuristic. That is what we have to think about and develop. But there is also another issue that worries me a lot, a lot that is evident in the International Watercolor Festivals I attend. I am referring to the enormous success of watercolors that inhabit naturalism and realism. There is a style that we can call international style. It's amazing how many of those watercolors there are. I think there are 100 or 200 naturalistic watercolors exhibited for every abstract watercolor, or one that represents a language of what were the artistic avant-garde of the 20th century. There are some expressionist ones, there are fewer surrealistics, cubists, even fewer, informalists, even fewer. Of all the languages that developed from 1830 to 1960, there is almost no expression. In other words, it seems that watercolor stopped in Romanticism, or it may have stopped at Expressionism, but it didn't inhabit the other avant-garde. This is remarkable. So, in one of those programs, we have to give those options, but not only to inhabit the avant-garde, but to inhabit the origin of those avant-garde which were Japanese, Equatorial Black Africa, all that we mistakenly call primitive civilizations today, any kind of culture that is not of the metropolis. Any peripheral culture can add up to us inhabiting new places and have a wider language. In a watercolor program to train teachers, this is very important. I'm not saying that we have to stop inhabiting naturalism, but that we can include everything else to stop thinking that this is the best subject. For me, that is very important, because I find it very striking that we haven't worked on it until now. I think it's fundamental that, for example, we teach this reduction that Picasso makes, this type of exercise, this type of reinterpretation of trans or translation of our optical world, because it seems to have fallen on deaf ears. To get out of these little easy manuals and receipts that explains how to paint flowers, how to paint seas, how to paint skies, or how to paint trees, and start working with a grammar. For example, this is called academic valorism. I wanted to contrast this with synthetic valorism, which is what you see here. Some call this negative painting, but it's a name that doesn't describe the fading of the shadow. In this second way of valorism, a gradient is used. So, thanks to a line gradient, I am describing that the calf is above the tie. It's a valorism, it's not a line, it's a faded line. And that same faded line separates all the leg from the bottom. This simple tool can help me to generate a system of representation, a representation system apart from perspective. This simple resource generates a sensation of depth and 3D. I didn't invent it, of course. Human beings use it long before drawing, 30,000 years ago, when we were little monkeys, in a way of saying, before painting, we already had a tool called a biface, like a small hammer, 
We did in the Paleolithic. Maybe we took little pieces out of a stone wall to complete a figure in bas relief and make this kind of grammar in the visual discourse. We call this synthetic valorism and it's very important to acquire it as a tool in the grammar of watercolor. These are some graphemes that I suggest for the use of watercolor, but they are not relevant because we are very short of time. Also, I'm not sure if I can make a correct translation from Spanish to English, but we are going to risk to illustrate the idea. These are some of the, use, the uses I suggest when adding a layer to the, previ to the previous one, if I want to integrate them. I mean, if I want to avoid contrast. The list includes six resources. Diffuse gesture, fading, transparent planes. If it is a transparent plane, it is integrated to the previous layer. If instead of being transparent, it is intense, we need it to be small. Then we have rustic gesture, that some people call frottis, and dispersed gesture, which is the brushstroke burst by a water sprayer or atomizer. There is not enough time in this talk to deal with this issue of the double outline shown in the image. But I think it is important in teacher training to talk about the dialogue of contours, the way in which one counter dialogues with another, as a basic problem in the use and freshness of watercolor. And here I moved on to an autobiographical photograph because I want to talk very briefly about how we enable ourselves to become artists. I had the opportunity to learn from Jason Nimmer and his team of instructors an activity called Acro Yoga. This is what you see here. This is an example figure or position. Acro Yoga is practices, practices between three people. One of them plays the role of the base, another the flyer, and the third is the spotter. It is a fun bonding discipline that has grown. It was invented 15 years ago and is practices, practiced all, about, all over the world. This is thanks to the fact that Jason Nimmer developed a worldwide teacher training program and implemented it with yoga teachers. He inspires us for this watercolor program. I realized that Acro Yoga grew a lot thanks to the teacher training program. Thanks to the fact that an Acro Yoga teacher training program was implemented for people who practiced yoga. But also, it allowed me to experience something that I thought I couldn't experience. All my life, I had felt a stranger and foreigner to any sport related to acrobatics. I don't even know how I got into an acro class. But I do know that for me, acrobatics was alien to me, a terrain for others. As many people feel alien to art, and this seems to me to be very serious. So, I want to say that, in my opinion, we are all artists. We are born artists, and an educational system censors us, teaches the concept of error, and thus eliminates the artistic vocation in many people. Art is inherent to the human being. I like this definition of the image. I don't know who the author is, but I liked finding it on the internet. If you are not in your definition of art, then that definition is incomplete. I agree 100% with that. I am an artist, you are an artist, we all have the potential to make art. We can all trust our ability to make art, our way. Of course, without the corset of the market. At the time, without the corset of the church, at the time, if you lived in Egypt, you were a craftsman or an artist if you were allowed by the emperor. But outside of those corsets, these corsets and constraints, art is inherent to our species, like play, like games. In fact, art is play. Art is our culture. Anything 
aesthetic that we generate is artistic. Any aesthetic phenomenon, any aesthetic discourse is art. And it arises and grows from a playful thing. With this, I close the talk. If I ask for a quick answer to the question, how many squares are there in this image, you would multiply 5 by 5 and answer, okay, 25. Then you would see something else and say, no, wait, wait a minute. There is also the largest square containing the others, so there are 26. If someone sees the biggest one, then they deduce that between these four, they from another one, and there is another one, and so on, and also three by three, they form a square. Well, that's the way we grow in community and communion. When one person triggers an idea, it helps another person to acquire another idea. In other words, there can be no Einstein without Newton. We grow as a community and our technology and our science grow from collective work. That is why I believe that this program needs collective work. It cannot be done by a limited group of people. It has to be a work of the whole community of watercolorists. And I say this from an emotional point of view, because it has nothing to do with a work that is limited to the life of one person. Well, I'm going to close the talk with this image by Klimt, which is not a watercolor, of course. For me, watercolor places us in the present time. It has that magic. When you paint, you are doing something here and now. You don't project. You don't worry about the past of, or the future. And that ability to be in the present is something that very few things give us. We get it from any artistic craft, whether it's shooting a rouse with a bow or making a carpentry table. Any art and craft, sports and meditation are activities that place us in the present. And being present allows me, in a way, to be healthy, to have a longer life, and most importantly, it allows me to have the capacity to love. That's why I think it is so important that we develop an international watercolor teacher training program. Because we are not giving watercolor to the world, we are giving it the possibility of living in the present, to heal, to understand love, to have a resource with which to live better.